This is KGW News at Sunrise. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here with us on this Sunday. I'm Galen Etlin. Americans are remembering the 9-11 attacks this weekend, 20 years later. We're going to take you to some of the local ceremonies in our community. Plus, the U.S. hits another grim milestone in the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to break that down, but in the meantime, we do have some nice weather to be thankful for. Let's check in now with Chris McGinnis. Good morning, Chris. Yeah, what a beautiful day yesterday was, and I think today will be equally nice once we get rid of the morning cloud cover. I do anticipate the clouds filling in quite a bit more so than yesterday. Meanwhile, we take you live to downtown Portland from our Rose City Sky Camera. We can see the Morrison Bridge lit up there. That's pretty cool to see in the lights of downtown Portland. Of course, we're a little away from uh, getting some natural light sunrise this morning. Still a good, uh, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes away or so. 58 last check in Beaverton. It's 63 in Portland, so we're off to a relatively mild start. Cloud cover definitely helping that out a little bit uh, across the eastern part of the state, though. It's chilly. Baker City right now waking up to 37. Meanwhile, 50 in Bend. Big picture here across the region. We did have a cool front work its way through the region. It's actually doing that right now. And so not only is that producing some cloud cover, but it's possible that parts of the uh, North Oregon coast see some patchy drizzle this morning. Whatever falls will be light. Whatever cloud cover that we see will break up as we roll into the afternoon. I've got us in the mid 60s at lunchtime and mid 70s later today with a partly to mostly sunny finish to our Sunday. Galen sounds great. Chris, thank you very much. We begin this morning remembering the September 11th attacks. Thousands gathered at Ground Zero, the Pentagon, and in Pennsylvania to honor those nearly 3,000 people killed 20 years ago. Millions across the country paused, not only to mourn, but to ensure the world never forgets those lost. You can hear those bells and then the moment of silence there. Hundreds gathered near the national September 11th Memorial and Museum. It's the same spot where the World Trade Center once stood. Many politicians, as you can see, including President Biden and former Presidents Obama and Clinton were there. And in Pennsylvania, former President George W. Bush, who was commander in chief during the attacks, reflected on what he learned about Americans after that tragedy. We saw that Americans were vulnerable, but not fragile. That they possess a core of strength that survives the worst that life can bring. We learned that bravery is more common than we imagined. President Biden did make a formal, did not make a formal address rather, but spoke with reporters instead while visiting Shanksville, Pennsylvania. He said the people that jumped into action to prevent United Flight 93 from reaching its target in Washington showed true heroism that day. Meanwhile, former President Trump released a video message praising first responders and spent part of his day thanking them in person. Now here in Oregon and Southwest Washington, somber ceremonies honored first responders and others gone too soon. Portland firefighters had a small ceremony at Firehouse One. 20 years ago, four Portland firefighters flew to New York City to help fellow firefighters at Ground Zero. They went knowing their brothers and sisters would really need the help. And among them were Neil Martin and Wes Laux. Both joined the remembrance ceremony. But I'm really proud that we're all here today and paying our respects. And I, I hope uh, we can keep this, this mentality up. The Campbell Fireboat closed the ceremony out along with the Portland firefighters pipes and drums. Across the Columbia River on Vancouver's waterfront, there was another tribute to heroes lost in those attacks. The event included remarks from Vancouver police and fire chiefs and an F-15 flyover. And the Seattle police and fire departments gathered at the Seattle Center to remember the events of September 11th. Because of the pandemic, this event was not open to the public, but was streamed live online. Just before the ceremony, the fire and police chiefs helped raise the American flag on top of the Space Needle. An entire generation grew into adulthood after 9-11. For teens in high school right now, it's a scar on American history that happened years before they were born. But a new film is helping students from Canby High School understand the magnitude of that day. And KGW's Art Edwards was there for a showing of that documentary that really tells the story from perspective in the Canby community. Dozens of people gathered at the Canby Fine Arts Center for a screening of the documentary called 
the Canby 9-11 project. We started talking with the Canby Fire District in January of this year. We knew the 20th anniversary was coming up and initially it wasn't a film, it was just what can we do? The idea began to grow to eventually include students from Canby High School. A dozen of them conducted all the interviews that make up the documentary. People from Canby recounting their recollections of September 11th and how it affected their lives. I mean, I definitely knew it had a huge impact, but I don't think I ever felt the gravity of the attacks, really, because I mean, I wasn't alive during it. I didn't see it. I've covered it like once a, once a year in school, but besides that, I hadn't really put much thought into it. For the students, the experience was life-changing. I've always heard, like my parents say, oh, I remember everything about the whole day, but I never really like understood how it really impacted people. So hearing different stories of people who were just at home with their kids or like the firefighters, everyday people, how it just impacted them, even though they really had like nothing to do with it. It made me just rethink like just everything. Like you can't take the little things for granted. It really like changes not only your perspective, but how like other people can interpret it. For those watching, it was a chance to reflect on what happened two decades ago and also learn some heart-wrenching stories from people living in their community. I was about 27 at the time, so it was, it was interesting to hear everyone reflect back on their, their experience. The people interviewed for the Canby 9-11 project want this to be seen as a story of hope. Art Edwards, KGW News. All right, lots more news to get to here this morning. Let's get to the pandemic. The United States crossed 41 million COVID-19 cases last night. That's according to an NBC News tally. 16 states and territories have seen a 25% increase in cases over the last two weeks. But these numbers here are really staggering beyond that. West Virginia and North Dakota have seen increases of more than 300% for four weeks. And in South Dakota, that's more than 400%. As of late Saturday night, there were more than 662,000 coronavirus-related deaths nationwide. Of course, many educators are worried about the COVID situation. Up in Muckleteo, Washington, a middle school student has tested positive. 140 students were told to not attend school on Friday as the school investigated close contacts. It found 72 unvaccinated students will need to quarantine for two weeks. 70 students who are vaccinated can go back to school on Monday as long as they don't have symptoms, but it is recommended they get tested. Starting tomorrow, everyone in Washington will also need to wear a mask at large outdoor events. This comes after five outdoor events in Washington turned into super spreaders and officials do not want that to happen again. Governor Jay Inslee's order applies to crowds of 500 or more and it applies to everyone vaccinated or not. Same goes for the indoor mask mandate that went into effect last month. Well, supply chain issues are a big problem during the pandemic. You may have felt it. It's impacting a lot of us. And now that even includes what kids eat at school. Our Catherine Cook reports. Breakfast at Powell Valley Elementary in Gresham. For many, it's their first week back in a school cafeteria in a year and a half. We have faced many challenges. Uh, getting school opened. Ben Guyton is director of nutrition services for Gresham Barlow School District. He says one of the biggest challenges they're still facing is a national supply chain issue. It's affecting the food and even the paper products used for the kids' meals. Pre-pandemic, that's 5,000 meals a day in this district alone. There are a lot of kinks in this supply chain. A shortage in truck drivers means deliveries are often late or incomplete. Food processing plants are also short on workers. And since schools were closed last year, many food suppliers have yet to ramp up production to pre-pandemic levels. We're, we're continually scrambling to say, OK, so what is next? What do we have? Do we ha have enough of it? Does it count the right way for USD meal pattern? Despite those challenges, nutrition workers are doing everything they can to make sure kids get healthy meals. That may mean fewer choices and some improvisation. Uh, adjust from our planned uh, soft taco to doing a burrito or an enchilada instead, or something completely different like a, a, a chicken burger, that's what we do. 
To help out, the Oregon Department of Education is giving districts temporary waivers on certain nutritional requirements, like the vegetable subgroup requirement. Believe it or not, schools are required to give students a certain amount of a certain color of veggies every week. But right now, that's just not possible. So we're taking advantage of that waiver. Guyton says even with all of these unexpected challenges, come mealtime, every one of them is worth it. They're big smiles behind masks and getting getting their thumbs up when, when I, I walk around the, the lunchroom. Catherine Cook, KGW News. And that's not the only shortage schools are facing. You've probably heard about this one. Portland Public Schools are down 86 bus drivers. That shortage is already creating some major challenges for students trying to get to class. This past week, for example, students on nine different bus routes were not picked up. The district says it's also seen more drivers call out. Vaccine hesitancy is also part of this shortage issue. To try meeting the needs, the district is altering bus routes, drop off and pick up times and asking staff from the transportation department to pick up shifts. Well, what do you make of this or oxygen levels in the ocean near the Oregon coast are dropping and coming up next, we're going to hear from two researchers studying these dead zones. They're going to share the impact on marine life and what this means for us.